Today we're going to talk about ovarian cancer. In talking about ovarian cancer, we want to um, begin to uh, dissect through all the different aspects of risk factors um, and uh, who gets this disease, what are the things that cause women to get this disease, and how do they present. So in ovarian cancer, there are a number of uh, risk factors that we know about, and there are also a lot of risk factors that uh, really remain unseen at the present time, that we don't necessarily know what causes them. So if we think about um, what are those risk factors that we do know, um, they would be the following. So think about ovarian cancer in this sense. Of those who arise from women with a family history, that's going to encompass about 10 to 15 percent of all ovarian cancers. That's a great group to know about because in that particular subgroup of patients we can identify who's at risk and we know to watch for their ovarian cancers in that situation and we can oftentimes prevent them from getting ovarian cancer because we know that that particular family um, is at um, the risk. Now if we want to talk about the other group then there's the ones that arise as we would say de novo and that's going to make up about 80 to 90 percent of all ovarian cancers. So what are the things that we know about patients who get ovarian cancer? Well, one of the things that we know to be um, a fact about them is it is age-related. So average age of ovarian cancer is approximately 60 years of age. These women also tend to have, um, they tend to be more commonly nulliparous women meaning they've never had any children. And one of the things that these women have as perhaps a risk factor is they have a principle we call incessant ovulation. And what incessant ovulation is, is basically they have multiple ovulations in their cycles and they've not stopped those for any reasons, i.e. they've not taken birth control pills or anything else over their lifetime. So we know this is true because if we take women who have um, taken oral contraceptives for greater than five years, those women decrease their risk for ovarian cancer by approximately 50 percent, which is an enormous amount. At the present time in the United States, there is not any acceptable screening that goes on for this particular cancer. The things that have been done uh, for screening for ovarian cancer have been things like transvaginal ultrasonography, have been CA-125 blood testing. Um, but at the present time, there is no necessarily approved um, screening tool for ovarian cancer. How do these women present with ovarian cancer? Um, the things that they present with would be, number one, would be bloating. And the reason they did that is because many women have a lot of fluid on their abdomen. Second one would be bowel changes. And that comes in the form of constipation and or uh, diarrhea. There are other things. They can occasionally have pain from it or menstrual ir uh, irregularities. But those are fairly vague symptoms and that's one of the problems with the cancers that they have a lot of vague symptoms. So once these women are evaluated and found to have a mass, then we ultimately take these women to the operating room. This disease is what we call surgically staged. And when we say that, what we're saying is when we go into operating a woman who has ovarian cancer, we are interested in not only taking their cancer out, but figuring out what other organs are involved. And that would be a surgical staging. So we do a numerous things at the time of the surgery. We, of course, take out their uterus, a total abdominal hysterectomy. We take out tubes and ovaries, bilateral stopping gufrectomy. We do things like lymph nodes and other biopsies around the abdomen. Um, which is too many things to delineate here. But these are all biopsies that we take to try to prove whether or not this cancer spread. And that's what we do when the cancer seems to be fairly early and just confined to an ovary. But unfortunately, many women with ovarian cancer have um, advanced ovarian cancer that's involved in, in a lot of different organs. And in that situation, we do a thing called debulking, which is a principle in which we go in and try to take out as much of the cancer as we can possibly take out of them. Survivals are tied in this particular cancer to the uh, success in which we are in the operating room. Therefore, people that really do a lot of ovarian cancer surgery 
are going to be better equipped to deal with this. And this issue has been studied in multiple series now, looking at who should be doing the operation. And consistently in numerous papers, it's been shown that G1 oncologists are going to have by far away the most experience and are going to have ultimately better incomes. So once we've staged the patient um, and taken this out, then what we do in this particular um, cancer is uh, then we give them chemotherapy. And chemotherapy here can be given in multiple ways. We can give it before we ever operate on those patients. That's called neoadjuvant chemotherapy. We can give um, just standard chemotherapy, meaning that after we treat them uh, with surgery, then we give them six rounds of chemotherapy, meaning we give it through an IV. Or we can give directed chemotherapy. And directed chemotherapy means that we give the chemotherapy directly to where the cancer is. And in, this, in light of this, what we do often is we give a thing called intraperitoneal chemo. So we actually put the chemo drugs into the abdominal cavity. That issue has now been quite well studied. And in women who had intraperitoneal chemotherapy, though uh, there was no more increase in the cure rate. These women ultimately live um, approximately 16 months longer. And so today we offer it to many patients, but one of the problems with the way of giving the medicine is that many of these patients had abdominal pain and more issues with nausea and vomiting. So it's one, it's a form of chemotherapy that we have to give and reserve for women who are uh, generally going to be stronger and more able to tolerate this form of therapy. Ultimately, the number one cause of death in these women is um, that they get small bowel obstructions. The cancer makes the bowel stick together and ultimately many of these women end up with blockages uh, which ultimately takes uh, the life of many patients. Ovarian cancer can be divided into a number of broad categories, five of them, and I'll make them uh, very briefly. The most common would be what we call epithelial cancers and epithelial cancers are the most common variety. These are the ones that we uh, are very aggressive. They're the ones that are associated with the BRCA gene, the BRCA1 and 2 genes. Um, these cancers tend to spread throughout the abdominal cavity through a process we call exfoliation, which basically means that the cells drop off the cancer and they implant wherever they land. And so that's a common way in which these spreads. But they can also spread through nodal spread, meaning they get into lymph nodes. The next family would be the germ cell um, cancers. And germ cells are what we generally see in younger girls. We can see them in, in girls even quite young. I've seen them under the age of 10 years of age. Many of these can be aggressive, but fortunately we have a very high cure rate in this particular situation. There is another uh, a family that we call the stromal tumors and these are ones that tend to produce a lot of hormones so they can produce estrogen or they can produce the male hormone testosterone and these women tend to have a lot of effects related to those particular hormones. There's another category that I call um, the other category that has unusual cell types like mixed mullerian sarcomas, small cell cancers, and these are more rare cancers, but highly aggressive malignancies nonetheless. And then finally, I want to make a special note of metastatic cancers. So metastatic cancers um, means that these are cancers that did not actually start in the ovary, but presented as ovarian cancer. There are three most common sites that we see. Number one would be breast cancer, one would be colon cancer, and the last one would be stomach cancers. And the reason that's important is because prior to operating on patients, we would want to look at, verify that we didn't think that it was one of these other sites because that would change how we approach this particular cancer. One of the ways in which we help make those decisions is with what are called tumor markers. Um, and there are a number of tumor markers for different cancers. The most common one for this particular cancer, of course, is CA125. And then there are things like for colon cancer, which is CEA. Um, and these are different markers that we would look at. In certain ovarian cancers, we will see um, the pregnancy tests can be positive. We can see alpha feta protein. We can see inhibin. Um, we can see LDH. 
and these are all unique markers to different ovarian cancers. The majority of these patients um, present with advanced stage disease, and the most common stage of disease is stage 3C, which means it's, in, it's gotten in the upper abdominal area. And length of survival is obviously tied to stage of disease, but in women who have stage 3 disease, what we'll find is that about 10 to 15 percent of these women will ultimately survive their cancer, as opposed to women with stage 1 disease, in which about 90 percent. And you can see why there's a lot of research and screen for ovarian cancer, because if we could take these women from up here and shift them down into this category, in other words, find patients earlier and get them out of that stage 3 and get them to stage 1, we would find that our cure rates would go up significantly. But of course, this ends up being the million dollar question as to how do we find all these stage one patients. And many people um, are questioning that maybe part of the issue is that we've perhaps been looking uh, maybe in some of the wrong places, that maybe some of these ovarian cancers are in fact fallopian tube cancers. Um, and there is a lot of evidence to suggest that some of these and many of these may be. Um, so anyway, that's an area of great research today in the U.S.